Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 1st. 2018, and my guest is E. Glenn Weil. Glenn is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England, whose work aims to use technology and economics to find new ways to organize societies to reduce inequality, increase productivity, and ease political tensions. He is a visiting senior research scholar and lecturer in the economics department and law school at Yale University. He has published widely in economic theory, market design, market mechanisms. And with Eric Posner, he is the author of Radical Markets, Uprooting Capitalism and Democracy for a Just Society. And that book is our topic for today. Glenn, welcome to Econ Talk. Great to talk to you, Russ. The book is called Radical Markets, and it's radical in many ways. It's an extremely ambitious vision of how to remake emergent markets from the top down using prices and incentives rather than regulation. The sweep of the book is impressive. It covers uh, property immigration, voting, data issues surrounding social media, antitrust issues, and it sees monopoly and monopsony as the root causes of many of our societal challenges. Do you want to add anything to that short summary before we dive in? I think beyond um, its ambition, the goal is to create a different sort of political coalition. I think that today's libertarians and today's liberals and progressives were in the 19th century both part of a coalition that saw fighting inequality as allied to fighting for freedom and, uh, you know, more open societies. And my hope is to break apart the standard left-right divide today and try to reunite that coalition. So that's that's an important part of the ambition of the book. Yeah, and it, it comes through. The book is, I think, in some ways an attack of both wings, the progressive and libertarian political economy visions, but it's also an embrace of both of them in different ways. So that, uh, that would be, that's one of the things that made the book so interesting to me. I'm glad. So I'm going to start with housing and land. Uh, you see yourself in the tradition of Henry George, and many listeners uh, will not know who that is. Some will be uh, he, he has still. It, it, it's funny. It's funny, Russ, because you know when I give this talk, I put up a picture of Adam Smith. I put up a picture of Marx. People get that. I then put up a picture of Henry George, and I ask the audience uh, if anyone can recognize him. One or two people, maybe. <laughs> well, the, the first one I got was at Google <laughs> yesterday, actually, uh, and it was a guy who runs a podcast or a radio show about Henry George. Yeah. So. Well, I was going to say, he has a few passionate devotees, yeah. and I hear yeah. from them every once in a while, yeah. uh, asking me what I think about Henry George. Uh, so tell our listeners what he was about and your proposal for restructuring how we treat land and property and how that builds on his vision. So Henry George was uh, probably the best-selling author in the English language other than the Bible for about 30 years. He was uh, – his book, uh, Progress and Poverty, was the namesake of the progressive movement. He just had an enormous influence on popular culture and intellectual thought for years, and his central idea – was one that wasn't just uh, special to him, but was really shared by many of the founders of the marginal revolution in economics uh, by uh, William Stanley Jevons and especially Leon Valras. And it was a concept called competitive common ownership. And the basic idea was that land does not belong naturally to any human being. It was created by God and uh, it can't ever belong to any person because no one created it. And creating private property over land ends up not just creating all sorts of unjust uh, benefits in the hands of a small number of people, but it also keeps land away from its most productive uses. Um, if you, uh, as actually Valras said, make land in big plots, you'll end up with aristocrats, uh, grazing their um, game 
And if you put it in small plots, you'll end up with inefficient subsistence agriculture. Only if you have a truly competitive process where no one person can monopolize land, where it's allocated to the person who's able to best use it in some competitive manner, will you be able to have uh, a true free market. And um, Henry George wanted to implement this by having a 100% tax on the value of land and no taxes on everything else. So our idea is very inspired by the spirit of his idea, the idea that to have truly free markets, you might have to make the value of uh, property partially common. But um, we disagree with him on some important details, which are that you know, he assumed that there was a clear way to make a distinction between land on the one hand and human labor on the other. But if you think about like a gold mine, Imagine you were to tax at 100% the value of a gold mine, but tax at nothing anything that someone had taken out of the gold mine. Well, then, of course, anyone who got control of the gold mine would immediately strip out all the gold and take it for themselves. Um, in reality, everything in the world is some combination of human effort and natural endowments. And while we agree with the principle of Henry George, we believe that in practice, you need to have a tax that's broader and that forces people to fully reveal the value of those assets um, rather than trying to have some government bureaucrat, as would have had to happen under Henry George, assess what the value of those assets are. Before you go on, the 100 percent tax, is that is that once the Georgian idea? Is that every year? Is it what was the idea there? Yeah, so the Georgian idea was that you would have – And why is it a good idea? Explain it to – because yeah. just to set the base. Yeah, so Henry George's idea was that there would be 100% tax every year on the rental value of the land. So um, that would be an assessment made by the government of how much that land would be worth if no one was at, uh, occupying it in rent that year. So essentially, everyone would every year pay the value that they would have to pay if the government owned that land and was leasing it out to them. It's a user fee, essentially. Yeah. Okay, so the problem with that, as you point out, one of the problems is that that ignores the complex complementarity between what people do with physical land and what they do with things we'd call property Exactly. Uh, obviously, you landscape your home. You, you do all kinds of things. You put fertilizer in the ground if you're a farmer. There are all kinds of things you do that make the land and your effort somewhat indistinguishable. But the original idea, as I understand it also, was that since land is, quote, fixed, you're not going to get some of the disincentive effects you get with other taxes. So one of the other selling points of the Georgian vision is the taxing land, which – you can't export land in theory. You can't take it. You can't hide it. it unlike labor or other forms of of economic activity, it it's, doesn't respond, I would say, as much. It does respond as the problem, but it doesn't yeah. respond as much to the incentive effects of the tax itself. Is that a fair assess point also? Yeah, and, assessment. I, uh, and, I, and I think that the idea of that, that we should – put greater taxes on things that respond less to effort and higher taxes on things that are more unique and therefore more prone to monopoly. I think that that is a deep, important insight. I just think the notion that you can cleanly distinguish between something called land and something else called labor is mistaken. And the basic principle behind the tax we advocate is to take that principle that you should you know, tax things that are unique and that don't respond too much to work – more than other things, uh, that we absolutely agree with. But what we disagree about um, is the notion that there's some objective, completely clear, categorical line to draw between land and everything else. So in your vision, which I agree with that part, so in your vision, the I think most people do, in your vision, I would state a value for my property, which would be my house at my current address. I'm a homeowner right now under the illusion I have private property or under <laughs> the social construct that may not be productive called private property. I own it. And if you want to buy it now, you have to um, offer me a price that makes it worthwhile. And I'm not interested in selling right now, so you wouldn't even know to 
bother me unless you went door to door, which yeah. people do in some neighborhoods. But in general, yeah. I can look at what's for sale, decide if it's worth it, negotiate with the with the owners, et cetera. You want me to, a very different model of how uh, land and, and housing and other physical property would be exchanged. So try to lay that out. Yeah. So every owner of significant private property, and let's put aside personal effects and, you know, things from your um, – you know, grandmother or uh, your dog or whatever, but any significant private property like a house, you would have to list a value for in a public registry, pay a tax on that value, and stand ready to sell it at that value to anyone willing to pay it. And the idea of that last part is to give me some incentive to pick a value that's actually close to what its economic value is. So otherwise, I just pick a low value. So, Well, that's one way of thinking about it. But another way of thinking about it is that the whole point of the tax is to get you to stand ready to sell your property at some reasonable price. Um, because otherwise, there's no opportunity for, for example, developers or someone wanting to build a train to see the values of properties and choose the ones that are the best uh, – value both for themselves and for the owners uh, to build developments, to build a train, to build skyscrapers, et cetera. So I'm going to give, I'm going to give you a chance to lay out the best case you can make for it, in my view, which is eminent domain currently is the way that we um, deal with large projects that have to, like the train you mentioned, that have to buy up separate plots. The problem with that, of course, is that there could be a holdout problem and to deal with that, owners, developers will often act in secret to acquire land, but it's still a challenge. It's still a problem, and as a result, and there's always the temptation to use the government just to – because it's more fun – to just take somebody's land uh, and arbitrarily uh, give them the some assessed market value. How yeah. would tr- – describe how the process would work with, say, an app on your phone as you do in the book uh, in your world. Well, I think the best example is um – Elon Musk set up this company called Hyperloop that was trying to build a um, route from uh, the Bay Area, where I think you're based, Russ, uh, down to L.A. In the summer. Directly. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, in the summer. Yeah. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. Um, yeah. Uh, down to L.A. Uh, directly. And um, the project, the biggest problem it ran into was the right of way, trying to buy up all those pieces of land that would stretch you all the way from San Francisco down to LA, right? And uh, that's an incredibly complicated process. Now, you could bring in the government to try to expropriate people, and you'd have a bunch of judges, and then you'd have to pay people, and who knows what you'd pay them. It would be a whole mess. Under this system, things would be far simpler. Um, The system would be one in which simply the... um, All the land would have a going price on it that the owner or the possessor would have set. And the uh, potential purchaser could just look up all of those values in a publicly available app. And if they found a collection of plots that they wanted to buy and develop, they could just say circle them with their finger or with their cursor. And if they had the funds, they could freeze those properties, make the transfer, and become the owner within some reasonable surrender period, like people have to uh, have to, you know, get evicted from their house or uh, their apartment or uh, uh, foreclosed on on their house, and they would, uh, upon that purchase, pay all that money to the owners. So the owners would be effectively determining their own compensation if the um, property were taken for this uh, purpose. So that's, I think, the most attractive story, which is. This system would reduce the costs and challenges of developing large projects over large geographical areas. Uh, the rest of the story I don't find so compelling, uh, both on practical grounds and I'm not sure on – even on um, uh, so-called welfare grounds. First, let's talk a little bit about efficient uh, – investment efficiency versus allocative efficiency as yeah. you do in the book. Explain why those – what those issues are and why they're relevant. So the the first thing I would say is that um, even though the literal geographic example of eminent domain is the most eye-catching, there's many other cases where something like this arises. So uh, in the spectrum, for example, for years, uh, much of the spectrum has been fragmented 
um, among people who use over-the-air broadcasting. And if you want to do Wi-Fi or if you want to do 5G, you face a very similar problem of trying to put together a bunch of spectrum licenses. In um, intellectual property, there's lots of cases where there are individual patents. Uh, together, uh, they can create a, uh, a new product, but on their own, they're not useful. So in many of these areas, you run into this general problem of assembling complementary goods. And that is one, but there are other examples of the problem of allocative efficiency, which is that assets can be owned um, in a way that is not the best potential economic use of those assets. And that can happen because of holdout problems, but it can even happen for simpler reasons. You know, the current owner of the asset is going to be interested in earning a profit if they sell, not just selling for the minimum that they'd be willing to accept. They'll be interested in persuading someone that the asset's really valuable. This is why we end up spending anytime we close on a property or buy a used car um, or anytime a company buys an asset, there's always a long and drawn out and complicated process of negotiation, which gets in the way of uh, innovation and the best use of assets. So that's allocative efficiency. However, the tax that I'm describing would limit investment efficiency. So what's that? That's the idea that if um, I think that the value that I invest in improving an asset and building a skyscraper is just going to be taken by somebody else or is going to be taxed away by the government, I will expect less profit on that asset and I won't be willing to invest as much to improve it. So our tax, while it improves allocative efficiency always, it reduces investment efficiency and the optimal tax rate has to trade off between those things. And your goal of just let's. I'm, I want you to finish the story, and then we'll dig back down into it. the The goal is to everyone would state the value of their their, their physical property, and let's just stick with houses and and ownership of land for the moment. So I have a vacant lot in Detroit. I'd have to post my, and I'm waiting to see if Detroit does better in the future before I invest in it. And nothing's happening with that land right now, so I'd have to post a, a price at which I'd be willing to sell it at uh, the home that's been in my family for two hundred years and eight, 12 generations, I'd have to post the value of that. Um, a, 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 uh, a retail strip mall, the owner of that land would have to post the ownership, uh, owner would have to post a, a price they'd be willing to sell. And that is their, their assessed value. That the, And then you're going to tax all that at a particular rate and you're going to do stuff with the money. So talk about what you think the right tax is going to be approximately. And, of course, this is on top of local taxes. This is going to be a, a presumably a federal property tax. And what do you want to do with the money? So the tax rate would vary by different types of assets. It would be different for land and intellectual property and so forth. But it would be on average about 7%. And that's a little hard to ponder as a property tax rate, but if you think it through, what it would roughly mean is that about two-thirds of the value of all major capital assets would be taken as tax revenue. And um, that would raise about 20% of the economy in tax revenue. By comparison, the government currently raises at all levels about uh, – 20 to 30 percent. So you could use that revenue to eliminate all other taxes on capital, including the corporation tax, the property tax, um, to uh, eliminate capital gains taxes, significantly reduce income taxes, pay off much of the uh, national debt. Um, so that's what we would do. We would do things like that with about half of the revenue. And then the other half of the revenue we would use as a social dividend of some sort that would be divided equally as uh, payments to every citizen. So uh, that could – you could think of that as a universal basic income or as an ownership stake in the national capital stock. Uh, that would, even just with half the revenue, generate about uh, twenty dollars to $25,000 for every um, – family of four in the United States. So just to clarify the numbers for a minute, uh, 7% of the value of the land would be about 20% of, say, GDP or something yeah. like that. So right. the land value 
because that might seem impossible, how you could tax 7% of something and get 20% of something. Um, where does that number come from? Why do you think 7% is a good – what's good about 7 or that ballpark? Uh, Why not yes. 20? Why not 3, 40? So the rate, the rate is based on the turnover rate of different assets. So the ideal tax is roughly equal to the rate at which assets turn over to new owners every year. And the reason is that when you're thinking about setting your price, if you want people to set it at their true value, you know, one force that makes them want to set it above their true value is that if they end up selling it, they'll get a higher price if they set a higher value, right? And that force affects their incentives at about the rate at which assets turn over. And if you tax at the same rate on that value, that exactly offsets their incentive to set a price that's above their value. So the turnover rate would rise in our world because as you set the tax, people will lower their values and there will be more turnover of assets. But we think that roughly the current turnover rate strikes a reasonable balance between allocative and investment efficiency and the turnover rate of uh, houses in the United States is roughly once every uh, 13 or 14 years, which is about 7%. Um, other assets have different turnover rates, so that's not meant to be uniform for everything. Many business assets turn over more frequently than that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, personal property turns over much less frequently than that. We might want to exempt that entirely or charge a much lower rate. So the rates would vary across different asset classes, but 7% we think is a good representation of what would be typical. Uh, are you taking into account the fact that um, I don't like to move? Aren't I, aren't I going to pick a higher absolutely. price than, than the, quote, value because I don't want to endure the transaction, transaction costs of finding another property? Well, the value, first of all, you have to understand that we mean is not some objective value like, you know, a real estate assessor would come in and tell you now or some government bureaucrat would decide upon. The value is what it's worth to you to stay in that property. And so, yes, absolutely, that would take into account um, your value of staying there. But an important thing to realize is that for a typical family, this would be an incredibly good deal. So a, tip, a median American household has about... $90,000 of net equity in their home, and they have, uh, uh, on the other hand, the average family of four in the economy. If you take an average over the assets of everyone, they have about a million dollars of net assets. So um, the revenue raised by this and redistributed through a social dividend would, um, on net for a family like that, if they price their property at market values, generate about uh, twenty one or so thousand dollars in income now, if they decided that they really didn 't want to move so they 're going to value their property at five times market value, then they would still on net make about fifteen thousand dollars, so they can get as much stability as they want by raising the price. And, you know, stability always costs. In our society, stability is costly. The wealthy live in um, homes that they own outright in areas that aren't disaster prone. The poor live in areas that are disaster prone and they often rent and can be evicted if the area improves. And so in this society, too, you would have to pay for more stability. But what would be different is because of the social dividend, everyone could have an equal chance to afford the amount of stability they want and the rich whose stability costs so much in terms of opportunity to others would have to pay a reasonable price for the externality they create. And you're presuming because we're in a we're in a fantasy world right now or uh, hypothetical if we want to be more <laughs> more uh, uh, appealing. Yeah. You're, you're assuming that that social dividend would actually be paid. It wouldn't then the, the revenue from this wouldn't be used for, quote, other purposes. It would be more like um, uh, the Alaskan situation where citizens right. of Alaska get a dividend based on oil ownership. It isn't just goes into the government coffers. Yeah, to, I, I, I would I want it to be automatic. You know, I, 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 um, I like to think of institutions that you can implement without any or very little need for any discretionary government authority. So I, I would think of it. You don't even need to think of it as being raised by the government at all. You could think of there being a corporation 
that everyone would own shares in that would collect this. And so people would be entitled to the dividends. Yeah, I like those kind of programs too. It's just that the government doesn't always tolerate them so well and they like to take control of them, which is sometimes not so good. Um, and of course can be, depends on the situation, the institutions and the structure. But I want to get at the um, the underlying argument that you make, which I find implausible. So I want to challenge yeah. it on why this is a there's a there's a problem here. So I certainly agree. There's you know, the resources that are un, underutilized. Certainly, people who hold property, they might have a um, a home that they only live in a little few times a year. That that's inefficient in some dimension. It's in in some definitions of inefficient. Uh, there, there are a lot of things you could argue are not great about the current uh, market for land. Um, and, of course, one way to fix that, the Georgian way, doesn't have this self-assessment, doesn't have to have this self-assessment piece. We could just raise a – you could just argue we should just put a federal tax on land that would make it more costly for people to have you know abandoned lots that they're not that they're not doing anything with. And we could take that money and, and re- reallocate it. But the essence of this argument – there's two pieces to it. One is that my home is up for sale at all times, in theory, and that price that it would sell for is set by me. And this the underlying this is an argument, though, uh, uh, and, and then there's a redistributive element, which is that the larger, more uh, larger, more attractive properties would presumably have higher values attached to them by richer people who don't want to have to move. And then that was, is creating this social dividend for the average, for the median person, say, or for a large proportion of the, of the public. But underlying this is an argument that I don't understand, which is an argument that the current market for land has a monopoly element. So defend that. Explain why, why that's an issue and why your solution is dealing with it. So um, the – argument which uh, really goes back to George and Valras um, but has a lot of uh, work in the 20th century is that land is unique. Um, There can be competition between different places to live, but it's very rarely the case that you have truly comparable pieces of land. You know, I just bought a house in a quite liquid market in Hoboken, New Jersey. And um, for the apartment that we found, we could find uh, only one really comparable unit that had sold in the last three years. And if we hadn't bought the one unit that we had been interested in, we probably would have ended up renting in New York City. That was our next best alternative. So uh, that homeowner, you know, had perhaps not the widest reaching monopoly. But it wasn't as if I had a bunch of closely competing alternatives to that one uh, piece of land. And that is true for a wide range of land uses, and it can uh, lead to lots of potential uh, waste uh, where current owners charge enough to deter a potential better owner of that uh, property from uh, buying up and using that land. And that may sound abstract, but there's actually um, a fascinating startup called City Builder, which what they do is they um, tell you what the value of different collections of land could be worth if you were to buy them up together. And for typical contiguous blocks of land, it's something like three times its current value in most cities. So this is not a, and that's holding fixed zoning regulations and so forth. So this is not a, I I don't think a trivial um, issue. Uh, I think that this is quite prevalent uh, and that there are a huge number of opportunities for making our cities work better, for making our spectrum work better, for making businesses run more efficiently, uh, for building innovative products that are blocked by intellectual property protections, all of which could be addressed if we didn't have this fundamental rigidity 
that is created by private property standing in the way of assets being turned over to their best use. And as I mentioned, this argument that I'm making, it's about as classic of an argument in economics as exists. It was first made in the 17th century by the physiocrats who were the um, – you know, founders uh, of modern political economy. It shows up in various forms in uh, Smith. It's very prominent in Valras, who is the, you know, one of the marginal revolutionaries. And it also shows up in Jevons, who is another one of them. It's uh, the central theme of Henry George. It was really a central dogma of the field uh, from the 1880s uh, through to roughly the Cold War. And it's fallen out of fashion, but it's uh, confirmed by Nobel Prize winning work in um, a whole bunch of uh, areas of economic theory recently and by a whole range of empirical work, including but not limited to the app that I was telling you about. Well, the City Builder app, I mean, it's it's clearly the case that multiple locations, multiple uh, parcels could have higher value if they were put together. And there's transaction costs of, of putting things together. I don't think that's literally a monopoly problem, but just in general, it doesn't strike me as plausible. Uh, your story about Hoboken is interesting. It, it could be true. I'll, I'll get my example. I moved to Potomac, Maryland uh, 14 years ago, and we looked at 20 different houses, and we didn't like any of them. And we finally found one we liked after we, we rented for a year, and then we found one we liked. Uh, it was the only one we loved, but I don't think the owner had any monopoly power over us. They didn't know it was the only one we loved. They had, they were in competition in their own mind, correctly so, with all kinds of parcels that they had no idea what their value was to me or to the myriad of people who would be coming in just through to see them. And what's the – try to give me the intuition of why the fact that it's not exactly the same house, exactly the same property gives them market power over me. I don't understand it. So the definition of a um, monopoly power that's used by the antitrust agencies, which you may agree or disagree with, is that if a firm controlling a certain market can raise prices above their marginal cost by 5% for one year, then uh, that constitutes monopoly power. Now, um, the analogy in a property market would be if the owner of a property can raise the price above the amount that they'd be willing to sell it for, for 5% for one year, that would be uh, a monopoly power. So um, I think it's pretty hard to imagine that that isn't the case for most land. Um, and in, in, in fact, there have been a number of attempts to estimate this that suggest that it's about 15% is the typical uh, uh, margin that's charged for transactions above the willingness of the seller to accept. But it varies dramatically. Obviously, it's much greater in these holdout situations than it is in other situations. So... Um, I think by the standard definition of market power, most land has significant market power over it. And the same thing is true for most corporations. So when most corporations sell to a uh, in a merger or a buyout, usually you get 20, 30, 40 percent premium above the value. And usually it's a long and complicated process to consummate that. So... I think that uh, it's pretty clear that that sort of market power over assets is quite rampant in the economy. And in the case of Spectrum, I can tell you some uh, quite clear and dramatic examples of uh, precisely that phenomenon. Yeah, well, Spectrum, I don't know anything about, so I'm going to leave that alone. What I do know about is buying and selling houses. I've done it a few times. I don't know a lot about it. I know a little bit about it. I've experienced it, and I think many of our listeners have. And, it, and when you're on – and having been on both sides of that transaction as the buyer and the seller, um, I don't feel like either a monopolist when I'm selling or mon the victim of a monopolist when I'm buying. Of course, there's negotiation and uncertainty, and there's a debate uh, between sometimes the owner and an agent about what the true value of the house is. It's highly un hard to know. It's really hard to know. And I think that's the source of the uncertainty. Uh, I don't feel like a victim. Uh, I've never felt like a victim. Maybe I'm a fool. Um 
I, I feel like I have lots of choices. And in fact, I think most people do. I guess um, I don't see why it being any different than any other market. But maybe, I think you probably think monopoly is more rampant in lots of markets. Um, no, I, I, I agree. I, I, I do think monopoly is pervasive, and I think we accept a fair bit of monopoly. And if we could purge that from the system, we would have much more efficient markets. I mean, you know, you look around you, most things don't have a liquid price on them. It would be very complicated to try to buy them. Uh, if we lived in a society where most assets were, you knew some price that was a going price for them, you would have just a, a much more competitive dynamic uh, entrepreneurial society because there would be much more opportunity for using things for better uses. I'll just say one more try yeah. on the home ownership issue. Yeah. So you're suggesting that when I go to sell my house, let's say I decide to leave uh, the D.C. area, which is where I live right now, and I want to live, say, full time in in the Bay Area, and I'm going to sell my house and I, I can – I'm excited because I'm going to be able to get a premium over and above the value I really have for it because other people are going to be stuck buying it. The people, the person who falls – I mean I, I have to say the person who lives across the street from us uh, has the exact same house we have, literally, physically. Yeah. Uh, they, but they did something different. The owners before us, they added an addition in the back, and the people across the street, they redid the basement. So they're not anything exactly alike at all. They're very different. They have a slightly different parcel of land. It's shaped a little differently, but the physical house that started was the same, but now they're different. And someone could walk into my house and fall in love with it or could not like it. They could fall, go into their house and say, wow, a finished basement. I've always wanted it. That's great. It'll be great for guests, et cetera. The person across the street said to me when they were selling – that they were they were going to charge a certain price that I knew was well above or thought was well above the market price. And I said, wow, that's a lot. And they said, well, it only takes one person to want that house. And that's true. But it's really hard to find that one person. You don't know who that one person is. In fact, the odds that you find them are almost zero. You're going to find yeah. the one person who loves the finished basement. So in what sense does that person across the street have a an ability to charge above the price they're willing to accept? It seems – Unlikely, given that there's lots uh, of people the, above trying the to price sell them. That, above the price that they're uh, willing to accept for yeah, the house. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you you sort of know almost immediately that that's the case precisely by the process that you described about what will the market bear for this. You you set your price not based on what you'd be willing to accept for it, but uh, what the what you think you can get away with charging someone. Absolutely. So that that is. Precisely the principle of monopoly. I mean, the pr the principle of competition is you set the price that you can, you know, that's not based on what you think you can get someone to pay eventually, but instead uh, based on what you'd be willing to accept for that property. No, so no, you set you set the price, and I'm sure there's some real estate agents listening. Not yeah that. You set the price based on what are called the comparables. You look around, yes. you look at houses that are like yours, and you set a price similar to yours. You don't say, well, I, I get more than that because I'm the only one selling this one. You set the one that you think is comparable. Are you live, is that a foolish game no, I mean, I'm look, playing? Look, look, is there really no comparable to my house because it's I'll, unique? I'll give you an, another example. There, was, you know, One of the places we were considering purchasing – uh, had been on the market for almost two years, even though it was new construction, in a hot market because they had tried to get a price that was much better than I think what the market would end up, you know, comping that place at. And that's very common because the market is relatively thin and there aren't always those comparable uh, houses available. They went about, uh, they ended up coming down about. Uh, ten percent or t almost twenty percent on that place over the course of that year and a half, and they still haven 't sold it so clearly that that is a waste of resources. That house is lying vacant for an extended period of time because they were attempting to use the uniqueness of what they had to offer to extract a uh, a rent and that that leads to waste, uh, and, and it adds up across the economy, and it gets much larger, of course, in these holdout situations we were describing. Well, what I agree with you is that markets for housing and land work imperfectly because there's uncertainty about the future, and people get overly optimistic 
uh, especially when markets uh, heat up, as you suggested, and people think I can make a lot more. And it's true that in those settings, sometimes it's harder to find a house if you're moving into that area. But of course, you're, I'm not sure your setting of that price uh, self-assessment is going to solve that problem because in a market where I think there's a lot of demand and people are, are desperate to move into it, I'm going to pick higher and higher prices potentially for my uh, value. Of course, I'm also going to pay a cost in the form of the tax. That's going to discourage that, I suppose. Yeah. And not only that, but because the value of all assets would factor in this tax, the value of the assets would fall dramatically. And so it would be much more like rental. There would be much less upfront cost. And as we know, rentals turn over much more quickly to their best uses than uh, sales do. Sales is much more cumbersome uh, uh, burdensome process precisely because people are thinking about all that speculation on the future True. and several other things. So, Let me ask one more practical question and we'll, yeah. then we'll move Absolutely. to a different topic. Uh, so you or I, we're, we both talked about moving into a new area. So I want to move, you wanted to move into Hoboken or somewhere near Hoboken. I, I was talking about moving into suburban Maryland. Uh, how would I do that practically in a world where Every house is for potentially available to me, which is a kind of exciting, right? Uh, I don't have to wait for a house I really love to go on the market. And uh, you know all the comparables. You right. know, you, you were talking about comparables. You would have so much more information about comparables because everything would have a market price. Yeah. Well, Zillow does that now. It doesn't. We could debate whether not, it does not, it well. Not so great, but yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. No, it's flawed. Yeah. As would this process be? By the way, I'd have my own challenges and try to figure out my own price. I assume institutions would emerge with brokers yeah. to help me fix it, help me decide it. But how am I going to look at a house in this world? Um, That's a great question. So the, the idea um, is that you could freeze the price of a house and pay an inspection fee to the owner to come and look at it in a reasonably timely fashion. And they couldn't change their price once you'd expressed interest. Um, but uh, but you wouldn't be obliged to buy until you'd completed uh, the inspection of the house. So anybody can come inspect my house anytime they want. In exchange for a reasonable fee, and you know, on terms of not being intrusive and so forth, that are consistent with the way that inspections work for home uh, uh, purchases right now. So one of the things about this idea that that's troubling to me is that. It ignores the cultural norms that have evolved, which which is one you're mentioning now. The idea of somebody coming into my house to look at it whenever they want by paying me a fee, I find unappealing. Most people do. Yes, when I want to sell a house, that's part of the deal. But I, in our current culture, the idea that someone could come look at my house because it's mine. I have this weird idea that it's mine and you're – you provocatively suggest that that's not a healthy attitude in all kinds yeah. of ways, by the way. I want to let, let yeah. listeners know that you don't just say, well, property's bad. You have some interesting, very thoughtful ideas about why it would be a better world if we didn't feel as attached to our houses. But right now we do. So that's going to be a tough change. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It would change culture in a lot of ways. I, you know, we have a lot of arguments about why that would make culture better, and, yep. and in fact, <laughs> we think it addresses many of the most common criticisms of the way that capitalism, uh, you know, pushes people towards possessiveness and a focus on material possessions rather than on communities, a focus on taking advantage of people in negotiations rather than just having mutually beneficial interactions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, those cultural changes would take a while, and that's why we don't want to implement this overnight. This is why we think we could apply it to, and I think you wouldn't object to applying it to spectrum, intellectual property, uh, natural resource r rights, et cetera, first. And you, know, you could already get to 20% of the capital stock or so that way. So that's not nothing. And then you could move on to business assets next and commercial real estate. And then, you know, gradually walk your way towards this. You could get 50, 60 percent of the benefits before you'd get towards anything that would really challenge some of these notions of personal attachment. And then, yeah, you, you've got about 40 percent of the way to go that would require progressively changing the culture around these things. But hopefully by that time, people would already have some exposure through their business dealings to arrangements like this. 
Yes, I like I like some of those applications, and you're right. I think those would probably be an improvement. I I would just mention, even though I I, I agree with you that we're probably a little too attached to our material items and, and yeah. possessions, that our homes might be in a different category. I don't think it's capitalism that makes us possessive of our of our hearth. I think there's something deeper, more primal there, but. That's probably um, wow. That's a, that's a conversation for a yeah, longer. Yeah, that's beyond uh, the scope discussion. of this. <laughs> beyond yeah. the scope of this. Um, l- let's let's move on to some of the other areas in the book. Um, let's move on, which I which I which I'm int- actually intrigued by rather than skeptical of, uh, which might be more uh, more fun, which or less fun, which is um, immigration. And you you make the point. Yeah. Uh, you and and Eric Poster make the point that. Uh, on the surface, the allocation of human beings to different geographical areas is extraordinarily inefficient, that there is an enormous benefit uh, potentially for humanity from um, people moving uh, where they live, and yet it doesn't happen. There are barriers to migration that are severe, and you suggest a very thoughtful way of getting around those. Describe it. Our argument is that the basic inhibition against the sort of value that you're describing from migration is the fact that most middle class, lower middle class people in wealthy countries don't really benefit very much from migration. Whether they actually are harmed by the competition in labor markets or not is a topic for debate, and we don't take a strong position on that. But it's pretty clear that most of the benefits of migration either go to the migrants themselves or to um, people who live in wealthy cities where migrants bring diversity of food and culture and so forth, or uh, more importantly, to the employers of those workers who benefit from access to uh, you know, competitive labor force. And, and that um, those uh, employers are mostly uh, the owners of capital, wealthier people, and because most people in the country don't own a lot of capital, uh, they're not directly benefiting from migration. So what we want to do is create a new system of migration where every citizen could benefit more or less equally from the chance to sponsor migrants and to negotiate with the migrant for a share of the benefits that she would receive from coming to the U.S. And we calculate that roughly that would be something like five or six thousand dollars a year if you sponsored a temporary migrant, possibly more if you sponsored a more permanent migrant um, for every migrant sponsored. So that could be a significant source of income for many uh, American workers. And and how, what would sponsorship involve? So sponsorship would involve um, helping the migrant find a job living in proximity to the migrant because we want to foster not just uh, economic value transfer, but a sense of responsibility, um, cultural exchange, and community with that uh, migrant so that we um, have a gradual opening of people, not just to the economic opportunity that migrants offer, but also to the cultural Uh, value that they potentially offer, as well as a sense uh, of responsibility where um, people wouldn't want to bring in uh, those that might potentially uh, cause cultural conflict or uh, uh, violence and so forth. So how would that work? How would I, how would it work practically? So you can imagine a variety of arrangements. There could be um, uh, corporations that set up boarding houses within cities and you might not uh, every day see your migrant, but you might interact with the migrant that you're sponsoring um, uh, every you know, uh, couple of weeks, but they would live in some area nearby you. Or you could imagine putting them up in um, your home, home uh, subject, of course, to uh, some uh, regulation and ex- inspections because you wouldn't want people to be abused um, by a potential host. But, you know, there's a program called the Au Pair Program where people host uh, migrants in their homes to take care of their children. And effectively, you could think of this as expanding that to other economic functions other than just caring for children, which only a a small part of the country can afford uh, someone to full-time care for their children. Um, So... uh, 
those are a couple of ways that you could put someone up. And in terms of the economic arrangement, I can imagine a, several different ways. You could imagine something where the migrant agrees to pay a fixed amount to the sponsor in order to stay in the country, sort of like a visa fee, which, uh, you know, in many contexts, uh, uh, migrants already pay fees like that. Or you could imagine that they would say, okay, you know, in Pakistan, I make uh, $500 a month. In the U.S., uh, I might make uh, thousands of dollars a month. Um, some share of that increase in my wage, uh, I'll share with my host um, in exchange for uh, putting me up. So, again, I think there's a lot of practical issues here, but the idea yeah. of it's interesting, and I, I wouldn't – a lot of people have proposed a simpler uh, version of this with less potential, I think, for abuse, uh, and I want your reaction to it, which is just yeah. let's just sell the right to come here. So, you know, right now, say to the United States, of course, we're not the only country people want to come to, but it's the one that's on the minds of a lot of Americans right now, um, and – Right now, there's a lot of debate about whether – about Mexican immigration, the idea of a wall. I happen to be more of an a open border kind of guy, but I understand that people are concerned about, say, American culture or they're concerned about the economic impact. I think those effects are small, but reasonable people could disagree somewhat about those things. So why don't we just say uh, that anybody can come here who can pay a $10,000 fee uh, and provide some – and you have a certain amount of time to find a job. And if you don't find it, we send you back. Uh, but but that opening fee would then be given to people who are uh, concerned, at least as some form of compensation. So that's really what we're talking about. We're trying to find ways to – you're really suggesting compensating people for accepting migrants. And, um, of course, that's not going to make other people happy who would, who would say other people shouldn't be allowed to do that, just like they don't like the idea that corporations or, or employers should be allowed to do that now. Um What's wrong with just charging a, a fee to get a, a big fee? Because right now people pay large fees to get smuggled here. Um, why would why wouldn't we want to capture that for the for the public? So first of all, I, I agree with you, Russ. I think that would be a major improvement, and I'm quite sympathetic to that idea. And in fact, we mentioned that idea in the book as an initial foray. But um, the reason why we propose and 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 by the way. We're not 100% set on the precise structure that we're describing. It's much more important to us the broader idea, which yours, your uh, proposal would also accomplish, of channeling the benefits from migration more broadly. So I, I think we're 90% on the same page. The question is, in the details of the proposal, the real difference between yours and mine is that yours has more of a centralized structure where you put more of the responsibility of vetting onto some sort of a central agency that would monitor and you uh, allow it to be a purely economic transaction where people wouldn't really get to know migrants and so forth. And our perspective is that that addresses much of the issue, but not all of the issue. I'm worried about people feeling that they don't know exactly where this money that they're receiving is coming from. And I'm worried that to build support for migration and for a diverse society, people need not just to receive some e economic benefit that's quantitative. They also need to be exposed to the people that um, they're receiving these benefits from. Uh, because it will make it much more vivid for them, and it will open their minds. And I think that that's what um, has happened to people like you and me. Probably the reason you and I are so sympathetic to migration is we've spent a lot of time living in you know relatively cosmopolitan big cities where we get lots of benefits from migrants, not just direct, simple cash, but also you know we learn things from them. We have different sorts of food. We, we, we enjoy uh, uh, opening ourselves in the context of a mutually beneficial economic transaction. And we think that those cultural aspects are important as well, and that the ability of citizens to express their preferences over the sorts of people they want to open their community to 
uh, within reason. You don't want too much blatant racial discrimination or something like that, but people may have preferences over the languages that people speak um, in their community. Um, you'd, ha you'd have to think about whether you want people to, you know, have have preferences over um, uh, religion and, and things like this. But allowing a little bit more of a decentralized market process uh, for those sorts of determinations rather than forcing it all to just be 100% filtered just through money, we think would be important to dealing with some of the cultural and social aspects um, yeah, of making migration work. Yeah, I don't see that working at all. I mean, let me just yeah. say why I yeah. respond to your observation about myself. Yeah. My um, my love of, of more open borders than we have now is yeah. not based on my personal experience. At least I don't think it is. Of course, it could be subconsciously. Yeah. I do have a, um, a Guatemalan house cleaner and a Vietnamese uh, handyman. And I benefit because they do a good job and their their prices are lower than they would be, I think, if we didn't have a more open society. It was even yeah. less open. So I do – I benefit financially from it. Culturally, I happen to like lots of different kinds of music. And so I, I think there there are some personal benefits for me. But for me, it's just a simple matter of justice. Uh, it's yeah. a reflection of the fact that I'm alive because my ancestors came here in the 19th century – late 19th century – Rather than staying Eastern Europe, where I would have been killed by the, they would have been killed by the Nazis, and I wouldn't exist. So I, I'm a big fan of um, of choice and freedom. So I think it's really good that people be allowed to live where they live. At the same time, I understand the concerns that people have about culture and its vulnerability to large changes due to large influxes of immigrants. I happen to think, as you do, that many of those changes in culture are healthy. But I understand why people might not agree, and I don't think your proposal is going to solve that problem, the people who are most alarmed about it are not going to sponsor an immigrant, not going to come into contact with them. They're going to resent their neighbors for bringing them in uh, and making money off them. How do you answer that? Well, so uh, first of all, I think that the economic opportunity will attract many people who are currently hostile. But second of all, I would allow communities to regulate them. I wouldn't want it to be a one-size-fit-all policy that would be imposed by the federal government on the whole country. Uh, I would prefer it to be um, at least partially regulated by communities determining uh, how they want to allow people to exercise these rights within their borders. And then people could move to different communities that had different attitudes uh, based on this because of the opportunity those communities might offer. So that would give a chance to people to um, uh, take advantage of things by embracing a more open cosmopolitan culture. And uh, I think many people would be attracted by that, not everyone. But if you think about uh, the number of people who moved to cities from uh, rural areas in response to industrialization and all the opportunities that that offered and that have moved in China, uh, in response to those economic opportunities and the way that's changed their cultures and so forth. I think that economic opportunity like that could be uh, a tremendous attraction. So we're almost out of time. There are a lot of other creative ideas in the book about voting, that people should be allowed to uh, actually buy the opportunity to vote more intensely for things they care – vote more than once about things they care about, uh, it cast more than one vote. Uh, there's some interesting ideas about our allocation of uh, investment and large investment banks and, and investment vehicles, places like uh, Vanguard and Fidelity, and whether those are good for the economy or not. Uh, there's some interesting discussion about social media and whether we should be being, how we might be paid for our data as uh, contributors to the knowledge that Facebook, Google, and others are using. We don't have time to get into those, but they're all interesting. Uh, and your analysis of the current situation of all these examples is, is interesting and provocative as well. But I, I am struck by the uh, my favorite Hayek quote, which has had a good run recently on the program, which is the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And this is a book devoted to design. It's a book saying, we need to reorganize all this stuff. We can do it better. Uh, there's huge gains that are available if we would just um, follow some of the ideas here that, that you've outlined. And you're not unaware of the fact that this is might be a, their pitfalls. And you're, you're well aware of the fact that it's not it's going to happen overnight. 
So talk a little bit about that issue and, and any unease you might have about your willingness to remake society and then how you might do it in small steps. As you've, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you alluded to it. Yeah. So um, I certainly don't want to overnight uh, remake the world in these ways that could potentially be very disruptive. For each one of these proposals, we have a set of relatively uncontroversial small steps that would get us a significant part of the way towards these ideas and also offer testing grounds to learn about the pitfalls that you're describing. Um, you know, we talked about property and the way this could be used for spectrum and intellectual property and so forth. In voting, even though the voting system is quite radical, we already have a startup that's doing it for polling and market research, and, and we're interested in online aggregation. Um, and the name blocking, of that is, and we'll put a link up to the site. It, uh, it, it's called uh, uh, Collective Decision Engines. Um, and uh, in in the uh, uh, immigration system, you could try piloting it in a city. Uh, as we talked about, you know, different areas might take different approaches. Um, uh, so with each one of these ideas, we have some very near-term, concrete, relatively uncontroversial steps that you can take in that direction. And at the same time, um, there's this growing movement. I don't know if your listeners follow the blockchain space at all. But uh, within, yeah, so within blockchain, there's a lot of interest in, in these ideas. And uh, those are sort of experimental communities that are trying out different ways of arranging things. And uh, my guess is that some of them are likely to experiment with this. Uh, one of the leaders of Ethereum, Vitalik uh, Buterin, uh, recently wrote about his interest in these ideas. So um, that's another interesting uh, testing ground. But the reason why I propose these things in such a bold and sort of visionary way, even though uh, I expect there to be increments towards it, is that I think that we are desperately missing an alternative vision that people feel could p potentially address the problems of inequality and stagnation and political conflict that we're facing as a society. And I think in the absence of an alternative vision, We've seen the emergence of reactionary ideologies of both the left and the right, sort of, you know, the state socialism of Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders and the nationalist populism of Brexit. And you see it in Italy and Donald Trump and so forth. And I think that we desperately need an alternative vision, even if the exact ideas we propose aren't the right ones or aren't exactly right in the form that's been suggested. Uh, we think that they offer a different way of conceiving of political uh, coalitions and uh, social ambitions where markets can play an egalitarian and opening and progressive role. And uh, we hope that vision can inspire people even if they don't agree with all of our exact ideas. My guest today has been Glenn Weil. His book is Radical Markets. Glenn, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you so much, Ross. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>